Welcome to another weekly interview from the Sustainable Futures Report. I'm Anthony Day. Your regular episode will be out on Friday as normal. Find the text of this interview and all other episodes on the Sustainable Futures Report website. All the w's.sustainablefutures.report. Yes, my guest this time is Christian Kroll, who is the CEO of Ecosia. Ecosia is a search engine. It's a sustainable search engine because it plants trees. A search engine which plants trees. Tell me more about that, Christian. Yeah, um, so it basically works like any other search engine does. So you type in your, your search queries and uh, when you hit the search button, then we show you search results. The big difference though is that um, we use the profits that we're generating from uh, the searches to finance tree planting projects around the world. So while other search engines basically pay money to their shareholders, we pay money to Mother Earth. And uh, this is how you can, by, by searching with us, instead of uh, other search engines basically contribute to reforesting our planet. Um, and um, yeah, we have a lot of users who are doing that. So that's how we already managed to plant millions and millions of trees. Right, okay. So did you set up uh, Ecosia as a way of supporting tree planting and regenerating nature? Or did you set up a search engine and then think, let's find a way of uh, offsetting, offsetting a carbon footprint? Because even search engines have carbon footprints, don't they? Yeah, so for me, when I started the company, it was actually after I did, so I finished university and I wanted to do something meaningful with my life, but I didn't really know what to. Um, and I did a longer trip around the world. I spent almost one and a half years, uh, most of the time living in developing countries. And I observed how unfair our world is and also how much we're destroying our planet and how much climate change will be a problem. Uh, so that was in 2006, 2007. So not so such a big topic back then as it is today. But uh, for me, that was kind of... Um, yeah, the revelation that uh, this is what I need to dedicate my life to. And um, before that, I was doing a little bit of online, like I built a few online websites. So I had a little bit of exposure to, to search technology. So I knew a little bit about that, that market. Um, and I realized I can use that knowledge to actually have a very, very meaningful impact on people's lives, on our biodiversity, and also on climate change. So the motivation came really from I wanted to do as much good as possible. And I realized that search engines are a great way of doing that. Um, and uh, basically, so what I sometimes like to say is that we are not planting trees to make money, but we're making money to plant trees. So it's really the other way around. And um, the one decision that I did uh, three, more or less three years ago was actually to turn Ecosia or to give basically all of the shares that um, I'm owning and also my partner is owning of Ecosia, give that to a foundation to make sure that Ecosia can never be sold. And it's also impossible to extract any profits from the company. So by that, we make sure that the purpose of the company to reforest our planet is always the, that's the key mission. Uh, and of course we have to be a, a profitable business to do so, but it's not about profit maximization. That was, that is very important to me. Okay. Um, We've got to the stage now where people don't even bother to say, let's search the internet. They say, let's Google something. Um, how big are you in relation to Google as, as a search engine? Obviously, Google's got much wider interests, but uh, where, where do you figure? Yeah, so I sometimes like to say that we're Europe's biggest search engine, um, which sounds really impressive, but actually that means... Um, we only have around 1% market share in our in our most important markets. So um, Germany, France, the UK, for example, it's roughly 1%. Mm -hmm. And 97% usually is, is Google's market share. So really tiny compared to Google. Um, and that's a problem. So I think that's very unfortunate. I would like to have more competitors, to be honest. Um, and also... Um, that's, I think, not only a problem for us, but I think a problem for, for society. So if you have not saying that Google is an evil company, but it's extremely powerful. And uh, a lot of people are basing their decisions on, on web searches. And if you have basically just one source of information, um, then that's a problem. And that power can be abused in some areas. It is already abused in their kind of 
But the, I think the bigger problem is that there are always those kind of micro changes in rankings that people don't even notice. So it, it can be very subtle. And I think we just need more diversity in the search uh, in the search market, especially because search engines are also evolving into personal assistants that are just taking a lot of decisions for you without you actually noticing it. Yeah. And that is, um, yeah, I think it's dangerous if you just have one player. So even if, if Ecosia wouldn't plant trees, then I would still say uh, rather use us than Google. Um, and also there's a there's a privacy gain that you get with uh, using an alternative search engine. So at Ecosia, for example, we don't store uh, your personalized searches. We don't create a search profile or a profile of, of you when you're using us. And that I think also has a lot of a lot of advantages. While Google is able to kind of pull together all the information that they're getting from all the services they're providing, and sometimes Google knows more about you than your own mother. <laughs> that I think is not great. Okay. Well, looking looking at it from a practical point of view, um, I do a tremendous amount of research for the for the podcast. And I have to say, it's Google all the time. Well, actually, it isn't, actually. Because I've, I've installed Ecosia. But am I getting the same results from Ecosia as I would from Google? So you don't get exactly the same results. Uh, much of the algorithms that we're using is based on Bing, so Microsoft's search engine. So there's where this is kind of what you probably would compare it uh, to in terms of result quality. That means sometimes um, you get exactly the same results. Sometimes they're slightly different. Um, I personally, um, I'm, I would say I'm happy with 95% of my searches, but there are 5% of searches where I'm going to Google. I think um, there are also searches, like 5 to 10% of the searches where I feel like, oh, now I actually got a better result if I then compare that to Google. So that, that also happens. And I think, yeah, you just need to take into account that we don't know as much about you as, as Google does which means you don't get kind of the results that are perfectly tailored to you, which is maybe nice from a usability perspective, but also kind of scary when you look at it from uh, just uh, information neutrality perspective. So it's a different experience, but I think for most of the users uh, who use it, it's completely like it's people often can't tell the difference, that there is a difference. Mm. All right. Uh, let's look at the uh, carbon footprint. There's a lot of controversy over what the carbon footprint of a Google search is. Uh, a lot of people, a lot of academics and so on, say it's between 7 and 10 grams of CO2 per search. Google says it's far, far, far smaller than that. Do you have a feel for the um, carbon footprint of your own operations? Uh, do you think it's a sensible uh, statistic? Yeah, so I think we don't know. I mean, we don't know Google's numbers. Um, I personally, when I, so we did some rough calculations. I think it's probably true that it's rather less than six to seven grams. So Google, I think, said that it's 0 0.2 grams per search. I think maybe that's a little bit too low, but I think somewhere in between that. Um, if you look at Ecosia's footprint, so um, there are two important things that uh, I need to highlight there. Um, first of all, we're for all the servers that we're using. So the entire infrastructure that we're using, we're using renewable energy. And the big difference there is to our, like the big tech companies that we're not only using 100% renewable energy, but we're actually investing far, far more than that into renewable energy. So we're actually using, I think 300% renewable energy, which might sound a little bit strange, but we're putting kind of, we're putting more dirty energy out of the grid than we're actually using. So even if you just look at the energy consumption perspective, we would actually have a positive or positive climate impact. Um, but even if that would not be the case, so even if we would not have our, our own renewable energy um, power plants, um, then uh, we would still have a massively positive impact through the tree planting. So we estimate that um, a search with Ecosia absorbs around one, one kilogram of CO2. Of course, it depends on how often you're clicking on advertisements and so on, but the, the kind of the positive effect is much, much, much higher than the potentially negative effect. So you're comparing, even if the numbers are true, the seven grams that uh, people are saying, I think it's actually rather one gram of um, emissions. In our case, you have one kilogram of, of reductions. And that is yes, very, very significant. If you do the math, um, I'm personally searching dozens of times every day, that means thousands of times every year. And that means actually a few tons of CO2 reduced from the atmosphere just because of your internet searches. And 
the average German, I think, has a footprint of 12 tons of CO2 per year. And if you just by searching your, your uh, changing your search engine, you can have such a positive reduction there, then you should do that. It's one of the easiest things that you can do to actually have a positive uh, impact on the climate. And not saying that this is all you should do. You should also fly less, uh, eat less meat, and uh, consume less things that you don't need or have kind of a more climate-friendly consumer's um, approach, I would say. But okay. it's still one of the easiest things that you can do, really. And but of course, it depends on your advertising. I mean, if I click a search, that doesn't have any direct effect. But if more you get more users, you get more advertisers, and you get more advertising revenue, and then you can have more money to invest in trees. But talking about trees, are you confident that, that trees are as effective as people would like to believe? Because as far as offsetting by using trees is concerned, a tree will take decades to actually absorb useful amounts of CO2, uh, or carbon, in fact. Uh, and therefore, you've got to be confident that those trees will still be there for decades. And there have been cases where People have sold trees and they sell the same trees again, and then they've put trees in and they've cut them down after only 20 years. So are you confident that going down the trees route, and maybe that's not the only route you're going down, but are you confident that that is actually doing what it says? Yeah, very good point. I think there's, um, let's say in the tree planting industry, there there's a wide spectrum of how good or not good this is being done. Um, I think we are on the positive, on the, on the kind of positive side on, of the spectrum. Um, and um, also, I think it needs to be highlighted that uh, tree planting alone won't solve climate change. I think that perception is very, very dangerous. It's one of the most effective things that we can do to solve climate change. Of course, we also need to protect forests that are already standing. That is, that is a very big element. Um, then in the, if you're adding trees on top of that, then kind of forests uh, as a whole can have a very, very positive impact on not only taking CO2 from the atmosphere, but also mitigating the effects of climate change, kind of creating microclimates that are actually then livable again and helping the water cycle and so on. So that is, trees can be, I think, actually one of our most powerful um, or are probably one of the three most powerful categories when it comes to solving climate change. So. Trees are one of them. Um, agriculture in general, or how we produce food and consume food is the second one. And the third one, in my opinion, is how we create energy and how we use energy. So that kind of, and then there are, of course, a lot of smaller things. But if you look at the numbers, there's uh, um, an initiative that I like very much called Project Drawdown. And they're highlighting the kind of 100, the 100 mm -hmm. most impactful uh, initiatives and trees are among many of those uh, among them I think among the top 20 you have 12 of them are either related to food or trees so it's really it's really significant yeah but that how doesn't close, mean how close are you to the to the tree planting I mean do you just send money to companies which plant the trees for you or, or how do you do it yeah so um exactly that what you, your point earlier tree planting needs to be done the right way that is that is what i consider uh, our role so we're not planting the trees ourselves but we're setting the criteria so that means that um yeah i mean there's kind of standard criteria no child labor no monocultures no pesticides and so on um but then also we are helping or we're developing together with the tree planting organizations and i think we have 60 different partners already it's a 60 different tree planting partners we're developing the, the 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 goals that they have for the projects and also the projects themselves and the idea is that we need to make sure that not only the trees get planted but actually that the trees survive in the long term and that is the tricky part i would say tree planting alone is easy but making sure that the trees actually stay standing that's that's the tricky part and the way you can guarantee that is not by building a fence around them or i don't know um I don't know, uh, potentially buying land or something like that. That that won't work, especially we're often working in developing countries where you can't like the yeah the the conditions are very very different from what you would imagine when you're living when you're living in Germany. So many of the things that you think you could do to protect a forest don't apply there anyhow. What you need to do is 
you need to design a project in a way that it actually serves the needs of the local communities. And if you do that, then people will not cut down the trees. If they're benefiting from the trees, they will not cut down the trees. Mm -hmm. So if, they, if they're uh, benefiting from fruits or nuts that they can harvest from the trees, they will not, people will not cut down yeah. um, the trees. Mm -hmm. Or if they know that they have, let's say, reforested a little, little hill right next to their village. And because of that, now the kind of stream of water is coming down to the, or is, is kind of filling up again, and they can do agriculture thanks mm -hmm. to that. And they know that this is because they've reforested that hill um then they also won't cut down the the trees so you need to take that into account need to take into account all needs that people have often in developing countries people also just need firewood you can't ignore that so you need to plan that into your tree planting project and uh, need to allow people to cut down either branches or potentially even entire trees as long as they're replanting them that's also okay so, and that I think you need to have this holistic approach. And if tree planting is done right and holistically, it can have really, really positive impacts on the climate, but also on a lot of other uh, important, let's say, sustainable development goals. And it can be kind of a, a super, a super power <laughs> that uh, that really creates a positive future and and uh, reinforcing loop. But it can also just be completely meaningless and actually have negative <laughs> negative impacts. That's why I think there's a big, big spectrum and you actually need to look where on that spectrum are you. Um, and yeah, a lot of tree planting that, that's being advertised is actually not done right, I would say. Right. Well, thank you for that. That's all been very interesting. Um, <clears throat> you won't be surprised that as we move forward to, towards November, I'm asking all my uh, interviewees what about cop 26 i'm sure you've got a view on that what have you hopes and expectations for cop 26 the upcoming climate conference yeah so i think my hope is just that uh, overall as humans <laughs> we agree on more ambitious climate targets what we have set up or what's happening at the moment is just not enough and that needs to happen in various and uh, in various areas so of course energy uh, agriculture but also then when it comes to um, protecting existing forests and planting new forests, we also need to be more ambitious. And I hope that um, yeah, our world leaders agree on that. Um, we also play quite an active role actually uh, highlighting how good tree planting can be done, highlighting the importance of tree planting when it comes to solving climate change and mitigating the effects of climate change. So we're actually participating quite a lot in COP and also even in the planning. Um, what yeah, what, what I personally hope is um, that also we change the, the mindset of, of, I think, people and companies as well. We're still in a mindset where a lot of people talk about reusing their footprints or kind of getting to carbon neutrality. I think it's too late for that. Um, I personally think that we already need to start thinking about how can we have a, the maximum positive impact on the climate. And that is, so it doesn't, it doesn't end if you at some point in 2050 reach carbon neutrality because that is already too late like we are already beyond the point where it's so being sustainable is enough so we everybody needs to think like what is the maximum positive thing that i can do and our world leaders need to think like that i think big corporations need to think like that because many i mean if you look at google for example of course google isn't a horrible company when it when it comes to um, co2 emissions they uh, invest a bit of money into renewable energy, the, the minimum, I would say, but they're doing a few things. But if you look at the more than 100 billion euros that they have lying around on their bank accounts, they could do a lot of good with that money. They could finance a big part of the energy transition or the agricultural transition that we need. And that would even be profitable. So if I think we need to start judging people by um, what they could be doing and not be fine if people just say, okay, I'm I'm offsetting my flights, I'm fine. Um, I think that's not enough. Uh, it's it's really, we need to be much, much more ambitious. And I think especially people from kind of the rich countries need to take more responsibility. And I hope that this is going to happen. And we, as Ecosia, we want to be a role model for that because we're basically giving away all our money uh, to to solving, yeah, not only climate change, but also other pressing pressing problems. Christian, thank you very much for that. That's That's been very interesting. So thank you for talking to the Sustainable Futures Report. That's uh, 
Christian Kroll, the CEO of Ecosia. Thank you very much for having me. Many thanks to Christian Kroll. Find Ecosia at ecosia.org, E-C-O-S-I-A dot org. I just want to make it clear that these interviews are not advertorial. The Sustainable Futures Report accepts no advertising, sponsorship or subsidies, and I have total editorial control. Of course, I'm always grateful for the support of my patrons who pay a small monthly contribution to help me cover my costs. If you'd like to join their number, you're more than welcome. Find the details at patreon.com slash sfr, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash sfr. I'm Anthony Day. That was the Sustainable Futures Report's weekly interview. Next Wednesday, you'll hear about using AI for saving water. But before that, on Friday, listen to your regular episode. Until next time. Thank you.